Okay, so welcome everyone to this um, Future Teacher Reactivated session. Originally it was called Future Proofing Future Teacher, but it was all about OER and open source and, and also our Future Teacher resources. Um, so we shortened the title this time just to OER and open source, but it's still all the same content is available from 2019 and some new content um, from this year, along with some great new guest speakers. So about these future teacher reactivated sessions, we've run these topics before and the idea of the reactivated sessions is they're more flipped, more focused on activities and more rooted in real experience with new practitioners and additional practitioners doing guest slots. Um, on my shared screen here, you'll see a link to um, the details about the the mini courses the journeys that we created and they're all available in um in a self-guided uh way via following these links um, in the resource later on so we'll share the link to the main resource as we go through um and alice there you want to share your screen don't you for this bit yep yeah i'll share my screen for this bit so Check that's all showing. Yep, is that showing? Yep. So it's just to remind you, because this is building on the foundation of the previous session, there's a whole range of other pages in the resource. You'll notice down the bottom right that we're on page 29 here. So there's 28 pages before this. And it's just to pick out a couple of highlights. There is a, a recording of the 2019 session that you can get to uh, with our speakers we had then. This particular um, link, the, the page on public sector accessibility legislation and the implications for OER is potentially quite interesting for you because depending on what the OER license is, you may be responsible for its, for its accessibility or you may not. So I won't go into the details now, but just to remind you that it's in that. Um, resource and it's useful to look at. There's a handy summary of OER resources, um, including the Padlet that we've been working on, uh, and thank you to people that contributed. Um, OER for different purposes, for research and journals as well, OER collections, and hopefully um, with that Padlet that Lillian will say a little bit more about shortly, you'll be able to get some really good uh, links there. Um, we've got our previous speakers, we've got an OER pick and mix, which is an interesting element where we've got the same resource in 10 formats for you to kind of have a play with and just see which of those you would find easiest to repurpose yourself. But I think um, and we've also got information on remixing the future teacher content. But the key thing I wanted to draw attention to was what you might do after this session. So looking at whether or not you might use OER in terms of supporting differentiation. Hold on, that's come up. I didn't want it to come up. Um, let's see if I can make it go away. No, Ron, why has that come up? <laughs> uh, it's a glossary term, but I yeah, just hover over the OER term again. I'm not sure why that's not going away. Oh, that's it. It's gone there. Yeah. Um, so differentiation, a really valuable where where you've got your own content, but use somebody else's to do a bit of stretching or to do, uh, do a bit of supporting with a simpler version. Inclusion, and you've already got perhaps something in text format. Maybe you could find a podcast or video clip covering the same kind of content. Add a transcript to a podcast. You've already had someone do the work for you um, in creating a really helpful podcast for the topic you're teaching. Well, why don't you use the time you've saved by not needing to create the resource by helping somebody move the accessibility along by adding a transcript and then resharing that out. And consider what resources you've got that could be shared and what resources you have that you might want to improve. I've often as a teacher thought I'd like to improve my resource but I don't really know how to do it better myself and uh, so somebody else with different skills could be really helpful at doing that. And if you do any of those things play with any of those things, do share your experience back. Lillian, do you want to talk through? Yeah, so, so this is interesting because we've run this uh, webinar 
uh, twice. Uh, the first time was in 2019. This is our second go at it. And so you can kind of see distance travel from the last time we uh, asked people, what do you want to learn when you attend a webinar on OER? Um, and we're getting a little bit more requests for um, things around the accessibility standards um, and uh, best practice for OER creation, use and sharing, um, how to build OER. So uh, not, not just creating the actual resource, but actual cultural change, organizational change, community infrastructure and expertise and support within an organization. So that's quite interesting. We're seeing a little bit of maturity. The term OER has been bandied about a little bit longer. Um, and ecosystems to support OER um, and emerging pedagogies and, and, and the kind of impact on students of using OER. And of course, we have quite a lot of people here for their professional development. So that's where we're at. Um, so on the next page, I think we've got our original OER Padlet that we um, sent out to people during the registration. We asked if you would like to share something. So if you've popped anything in the chat, you might want to come along to our Padlet. I'm going to put the link directly in the chat uh, to the Padlet. Um, and, you know, lots of us are very curious about where do we go to get quality resources. So these are, if you like, this, your starting points. Um, some people have put in subject specific things, other people have put in, if you like, much more generic things. Um, the iForce looks very interesting. I was very interested in the uh, Ireland uh, one, open.teachingandlearning.ie. I thought that was a fabulous resource. Uh, Alistair, if you don't mind clicking on it. And thanks to, um, is it Limerick uh, University uh, who, who uh, popped that link in there? Because if you scroll down, there's a lot of, um, literally, it, it's like an OER course. I, I really feel like this is a fabulous resource. So if you're wanting to start to introduce colleagues to the concept of OER, you could do uh, not much better by, by, by sending them along to this site and asking them to spend an hour just reading through it and getting to grips with it. Um, I think they learn a lot from that. And of course, watching the recording of this afterwards as well. So that brings us on to our first guest speaker and uh, Stuart Nicole from the University of Edinburgh is going to be speaking and the University of Edinburgh is a leader in OER and so we're going to hear about how that process came about, what the cultural impacts and requirements have been. So I'm going to stop sharing and over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I'll just share my, try and share my screen. Uh... Okay, Has that worked? Showing. Yep, that's all working. Cool. Okay. Um, I'll start now. Hi, hi. So thanks for inviting me along. Um, my name's Stuart Nicholl. I'm head of e-learning services at the, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about our approach and position on, on open educational resources. Um, we've had a policy, um, an OER policy, an institutional policy since 2016 um, and a support service in place since about 2014. So I'm just going to talk a bit about what we do, what our approach is, and reflect a bit on, on our journey um, along the way. Um, when I started to think about this presentation, I was reminded of a presentation I did with some colleagues um, at the OER conference in 2015 in, in Cardiff. I don't know if, if anybody was, was at that. Um, I did a presentation with my colleagues Melissa Heighton and Dash Secker from the Student Association, and and we really talked in that presentation about the early part of the journey um, that we had at the university, which is uh, in around 2014, um, and it reminded me that um, that this was really for us. This was really um, student led. Um, the kind of move and kind of you know the, the ask at an institutional level to do something about open education and open education. OERs came from students. Um, there had been a National Union of Student paper published around about that time about the positive attitudes that students have towards institutions who engage with OERs. So I think that might have been something that inspired our student association to challenge the university senior managers to explore how learning materials could be made 
open not only to students at Edinburgh, but across Scotland and to the wider world. Um, which sounded a lot like advocating for opening the virtual learning environment. And, and our Senate Learning and Teaching Committee um, took this all quite seriously and, and set up a subcommittee, an OER short life task group, um, which was established to look at this. Um, and at the time, it's interesting that it felt like a technical challenge. It felt like the ask was, how do we open up the materials in the VLE? Um, and, and some of the early papers around that were around the technical challenges there. But actually at that time, another change happened at the university where our, my colleague Melissa Hyten joined us as director of learning, teaching and web services. Um, and Melissa brought a lot of experience from what had been happening at Leeds University and what she'd done at Oxford University as well around OER projects and approaches. And that started to, to shape our, our thinking as well. Um, and actually, as through, through that year, we, we started to realize that, you know, this isn't a technical challenge at all. It's, it's a, a digital literacies challenge, really, really around developing OER practices. Um, and just quickly um, to touch a bit on the policy that we've got at the university. And it's just really to say that the it's very much focused in the area of teaching and learning rather than in the library. So it's actually owned by the Learning and Teaching Committee. Um, it's very much focused on, on teachers and improving teaching practices. This is an excerpt from, from the policy. Um, but it was also really there as a tool for us as well. Um, we, um, you know, in terms of setting up a OER service to support teaching colleagues um, needed something that said that the university supported the open sharing of teaching materials. Um, so it serves multiple purposes, the policy. Um, I also look back at some of the sessions that I was doing back in 2014 um, when we first set up the service. And, and this is a slide um, from one of the sessions that I was doing around then. And you can see that it is very much focused on teaching practice. Um, it's with teachers in mind that we're, we're, we're um, putting this OER service together. So it's about not reinventing the wheels so freeing up your time to focus on other aspects of teaching and learning. It's about raising your profile um, whilst um, increasing the impact of your resources. It's about taking resources with you. So uh, kind of a bit of a nod to the fact that a lot of academics are quite nomadic um, and, and moving in between institutions. And by sharing your, your, your teaching materials, it kind of facilitates you as much as anyone else to, to be able to take your materials into, into other institutions. And it also improves your teaching. So, so teaching in the open adds an, an extra level of scrutiny. So it encourages teachers to, to reflect on, on, on the materials that they're putting together and also to connect with people that are interested in the same areas and get different views onto, onto topic areas that you're interested in. Um, I wanted to kind of quickly talk about our journey again, and I was I kind of mapped this out as a, a network of, of influence under three different themes. So, so I want to talk around the committees that we engaged with at the universities where we're putting this, this institutional level kind of thing together, the reports that influenced us and, and the policies that we, that we derived ours from. So starting, starting with the committees, um, we were engaged with our learning and teaching committee, um, and you can see that from the early papers in 2014, it moved from a conversation about open access to the VLE to when we finally took the policy um, to LTC. It was around the, the policy, and the policy is much more about digital literacies. In terms of the reports that we were kind of drawing our influence from, um, we engaged CETUS um, at an early stage with us to do three reports for us. One was on practitioner engagement and perceptions. And that really showed us that at the university, um, the kind of I, the perceptions and um, about what OER is, you know, wasn't very developed. People didn't have a very good understanding about what OER practice is. Um, we had a technology report that was that was um, developed around the technologies we might use um, to kind of um, make our OERs available and um, something around uh, description discovery as well. We had a, a report that was written around benchmarking, who was doing what across the university. 
Another one about MOOCs to OERs, we, we do a lot with MOOCs at Edinburgh University. And at the time we knew a lot about that, but less about OERs. So we had a report about how do we open up our MOOC materials out of the MOOC platforms and make them more openly available. And then finally, uh, around policies, and just to say our policy isn't an original one at all, we, de we developed from the work of others, and, and that was facilitated through Creative Commons licensing. So really, it's based on a, a policy that was um, developed at the University of Leeds, then redeveloped at Greenwich and Glasgow Caledonian, and we pulled the best bits of that into our policy, we redeveloped that, um, made it our own, and we've reshared that under a Creative Commons license, and um, so that is openly available. And just to say quickly, that's really driven our approach to policy development at the university. We've got a number of policies now that are, that are shared under open licenses, a virtual classroom lecture recording policy, for example. And just a note on the relationship between policy and service, just quickly, the two are very inter interdependent. We felt that the, a policy on its own isn't very effective because you need action to back that policy up, which is why we needed the service to help develop people's skills, but also the service needs a policy. And um, because, like I said before, we needed to be able to say to academic colleagues who were kind of a little bit dubious about whether about sharing things openly and freely, why would the university want us to do that, that we can say, no, absolutely, it does. The university is very supportive of this and it aligns with our mission and values. So the, the policy and, and service are very interdependent. Um, and just to sort of give you a little bit of a view onto what our, what our service at the university looks like. Um, so we have an, our outward face and open ed website. Um, the service manages this website, it contains advice, guidance, reflections from practitioners and, and links to various collections across the university. Like I said earlier, we decided this wasn't a technical kind of OERs at Edinburgh isn't a technical issue, it's a, it's a practice issue. So we didn't put a repository together, rather we encourage colleagues to share on the most appropriate platform openly on the web. So if it's a 3D model, it would be Sketchfab. If it's an image, it's Flickr. We share a lot on Wikimedia. Um, and we share data on our Edinburgh um, data share platform. And on our Open Ed website, we have those collections advertised. So if you visit there, we, we have them categorized under subjects. Um, um, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, subject uh, um, and uh, even United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you can drill do through um, uh, based on what, how, how those things align. And just finally, just quickly, what I'd say, like a, one example of a piece of um, open work that we've been doing recently is uh, we've recently published our first open textbook. Um, and interestingly, it's a very good example of how open licensing can facilitate teaching materials to be used in different contexts. The Fundamentals of Music Theory is a, is a MOOC that we developed probably in about 2014. It's become a four credit course, so it's a 20 credit course as well that's used within the School of Music. And we've recent re, recently reworked it this year into an open textbook as well, which is the first open textbook that we've, we've published. Um, and yeah, so that's me. I think I'm on the 10 minutes, Alistair. Um, just some contact details there uh, for myself and <clears throat> other members of the team, Lorna Campbell and Stephanie Farley. Brilliant timing. Well done, Stuart. And some really rich materials that I I'm sure people will have already been commenting on if you want to have a look through those. Um, we're going to leave time for discussion a little bit later after we've had all three presentations. So I'm going to go straight on now to Lou Stringer and Steph Jesper, and I believe you're sharing your own screens, is that right? That's right, yeah. Great. Um, so while I, I do that, I'll let Lou introduce us all. And while you're doing that, just to remind you, there's a five minute bell halfway through and then a, a nine minute bell when you've got a minute left. Okay, so hi folks. So me and Steph work together at the University of York within um, two different teams, but um, within the library, really. So we work on academic skills. Um, I'm mostly here just as a psychic, so Steph will be leading us today. Um, so we're going to talk about the skills guides that you can see here, which um, I'll let Steph describe. Yeah, so uh, these are uh, guides that have been produced in collaboration with a lot of people, but I'll get to that. Uh, I want to give you a bit of a history lesson. So uh, University of York 
We first uh, sort of partnered uh, together from library and IT uh, to create something called Iliad uh, many, many, many years ago, back in, in 1994. Iliad stand, stood for Information Literacy in All Departments. Uh, and uh, here is the original University of York uh, web page uh, uh, back when that launched in the same year, 1994. And there was very much a sort of sense of partnership between IT services, it was created this, or computer services, as it was called back in those days, and the library. So things that emerged from this were these things like your information connections. And here is what that kind of looked like. There was a, a, an attempt to gather together subject guides and things like that, um, subject resources. And this was aimed very much not just at the university community, but also at any members of the public who managed to find their way onto the internet back in 1994. There was a, a lot of stuff happening with the York Council at that point to try and, and, and pursue those goals. Uh, so from this very first step onto the internet, we were very keen to have open resources, resources that anybody could access so long as they got the connection to do so. Um, now, these were just web pages, good, good old fashioned HTML on the content management system at York. Uh, but um, there's a tool in libraries uh, called LibGuides. Uh, and here is one of the most famous LibGuides in the world. This is the uh, Beyonce's Lemonade uh, and Information Resources. Uh, from the uh, Maryland Institute uh, of Art. And LibGuides is a platform made by Springshare. Uh, so, uh, was there something, is there something wrong with my screen sharing? Can you, can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. We can yeah, see we it. can see it. I think it's um, a specific issue with the captions. So you, you right, carry yeah. on, you're fine, yeah. yeah. So like I said, LibGuides is a tool made by Springshare. And the, the idea of this is that uh, university libraries, uh, college libraries can share resources through a system of aggregated links that are centrally controlled, which is very handy for things like the databases that we subscribe to as a university. Uh, so it was that in 2012, uh, University of York Library got uh, its own set of LibGuides, which it continued to call subject guides. Uh, and here they are. So each department has its uh, own uh, guide and that's all administered uh, by the uh, academic liaison librarian team. Um, now, around about the same point in 2012, uh, we had a uh, restructure and that was very much based on things that have been happening in Manchester uh, in terms of, of library structure over there. And that created the teaching and learning team, which is the team that I'm a member of. Uh, and that teaching and learning team, uh, here we are, is uh, a team that is very much sort of geared around the kind of principles of uh, uh, user education in terms of application support, but also uh, being creative, trying to do a lot of the things that are sort of marrying together again, this sort of IT and, and library perspective. And we were looking for inspiration, we we're looking for ideas, and some of the places that we went to in terms of ideas were things like uh, Leeds and Manchester, and my carefully curated uh, tabs have all stopped uh, loading, so that's uh, uh, rather annoying, but never mind. Um, they've all gone to sleep again. Uh, so we were very inspired by Manchester and Leeds in terms of what they were doing, and a lot of what they were doing were things like articulates. So we thought, oh, let's do a bit of that. Let's try and uh, embrace some of that. And we built loads of these really elaborate articulate things, uh, and they were beautifully made things and we, we were quite proud of them. You know, we got to do things like messing around with truncation and we got quite involved with uh, being able to put things in uh, and have sort of interaction in there. Um, so for instance, let's have a go at that one. Organ, organy, let's see. Oh, like that. Let's click on search. Oh no, you see organy asterisk, that can get organist, can't it? That's no good. Anyway. We then uh, thought, actually, the problem with these articulates is everything's a bit closed. So we started to put together things uh, like the skills guides. So the skills guides was a project that we launched. It's gone through a few different phases. Uh, but this was a, an attempt to pull in other skills teams around the university. So we produced 
a set of categories, themes that we could organize information by trying to get other people involved. So we, we, we talked to uh, Lou's team uh, and, and other teams around the university to try and get ideas for this. And we started to work in this LibGuides platform because great things about LibGuides is that it is modular, which means that we can move things around, but it's, we can put any old script in there any old style in there and it's very accommodating very accepting of that kind of thing which means that we can build interactive stuff the sort of the things that we were building in articulate but it was very locked down in articulate we can start to build in this libguides platform using proper html and, and uh, proper jquery and stuff like that things that are going to be used we could even kind of completely take that original idea of those articulates and rebuild them in the skills guides uh, but we also wanted, like I said, the modularization of this, the modularity of this to be a, a great, important thing. There was a project happening at the University of York called the York Pedagogy, and we wanted to get involved with that. And that was all about uh, making sure that digital skills were embedded within curricula, that kind of thing. So we uh, made it so that all of the items in the skills guides could be embedded in the VLE, embedded anywhere you like, any web page. Uh, you could take the code here and stick it anyway. So that was all part of that York pedagogy principle. Uh, and at the same time as all this, we're getting a lot more online growth, online courses happening. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we're accommodating them. We've got this university of the public for the public good, uh, the university strategy that's uh, currently going. And this is, again, carrying on from those original intents that we had in 1994 about uh, creating resources that anyone can use. Uh, we had our uh, MOOC as an attempt to uh, uh, do that. So a massive open online course. But we were all the while keen for these skills guide content that were produced to be reusable. And a lot of that was down to ideas about Creative Commons as well. We've been inspired by Leeds. We've been inspired by Manchester and they were using Creative Commons. We're librarians at heart. So uh, we are obviously very keen on sharing things. That's an entire ethos. So all of this kind of thing was, was rolling together to create these uh, bits of content we can just reuse anywhere. And so we've got guidance here on how to reuse it. All these boxes can be popped out to create uh, standalone boxes. Here we go, there's one. Like I say, it's all embeddable, uh, all rip-offable on the uh, Creative Commons license uh, and all available for anyone to play with. So if you fancy finding anything that we've got and playing around with it and stealing it, take a look at the skills guides, take a look at the index, have a play. We've got all sorts of bits and bobs, stuff about spreadsheets, things like that. And this has all been a collaboration between the library, between IT, between, between the skills teams, learning enhancement, uh, between careers, everyone's starting to get involved now. It's really good and all modular, all stuff that you can rip off. And is that the end? Yeah. Excellent. You had 30 spare seconds you could have used. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's that second you can use to, to go and see what we've got and take it. I was Absolutely. Gonna say, I, can, I can add that. Like, just go visit the skills guides, look at what we have. We've got loads of stuff. Sounds brilliant. Do you want to make sure that you pop that link again in the chat? Absolutely. Now, so it's in at the beginning and at the end. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now, what we've done so far, we've, we've been going from what we could describe as the macro, the whole institution approach, which um, Stuart talked about. We've gone to the MISO scale here, where we're looking at um, a, a kind of area of the university, looking at study skills, skills guides. We're now going to go down to the micro level, where we're talking about how do you actually get a human being in front of you to engage in OER? What are the barriers that there might be? And in some cases, barriers that you wouldn't necessarily have expected. And that's where we can hand over to Rosemary. And I think Rosemary um, McKilwin from Heriot Watt University uh, is going to be taking us through the next bit, sharing your own screen, I think. Yeah, and it's there. It's perfect. We can see it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, so I would like to invite you to give yourself and others the gift of openness. Um, so let me talk about what I mean by that.
Um, so we've talked about OER and I'm sure this is a definition you're all familiar with, but being an academic, I like my definitions and it's useful to go back. Um, but it's also part of the key conversation that I have with so many people um, about why they might want to engage with OER. Um, so it's a good sales tip. Um, but what we can see from this is that OER really is a gift. Um, who wouldn't want ready-made resources that they can reuse and adapt to suit their teaching? So Alistair mentioned, I'd talk a little bit about barriers. Um, and these are all things that I've come up against when talking to people across various institutions about why they might or might not want to use OER. So key among it is lack of awareness. So people haven't heard about OER. So um, research in 2016, and I'm sure things have changed since then, but 2016, 40% of people in Scottish um, universities were unaware of OER. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, so 40% were unaware and 40% more were unsure. You know, I've kind of heard of it, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So only 20% were really solidly confident on, yeah, I know what an OER is. So not actually knowing what it is, is a big barrier. But then for those who had, it's about not knowing, first of all, where to find an OER or how to go about using it, um, you know, and make sure that you're using it properly. That's a real fear for people. Um, but then if you have done that, then really being confident in the benefits of using OER. Now, some of those might seem fairly obvious, um, but we'll, we'll come to that. But then thinking about the flip side, you know, maybe people are quite used to, you know, getting a Creative Commons licensed video or podcast or image, but they're then thinking, oh, what about maybe sharing my own as a OER? So for them, there are also key challenges. So firstly, not seeing the benefits of using OER or not seeing the benefits of sharing their own resources in that way, or the big imposter syndrome, feeling like your resources aren't good enough. Or the flip side, my resources are too good. I've spent hours on these, um, so I don't want to share them with anyone else, just with my students. Um, or finally, and I'm sure this is something we'll all be familiar with, lack of time. Um, you know, we'd all like to have more time available to us. So I'm going to share a couple of case studies um, that hopefully address each of these points. So case study one, um, a colleague came to me and said, I've got these outputs that you know, we've got through public funding um, and we really want to make it available to everyone across the world. But guess what? Not sure how to get around that with copyright, you know, what, what's appropriate to do. But I really want people to not just take the outputs and read them, but to actively adapt them and make these courses their own. So we had a bit of a chat about, you know, what OER was. They'd never heard of it before. Um, and we were able to say, OK, this is something that would be useful to you. So it was then a conversation about, well, what would that look like? You know, where would you host it? And um, what kind of license would you like? And indeed getting into the different understandings of the different licenses, you know, so what's most free, what's least free um, and everything in between. So they decided to release the resource um, under a Creative Commons share alike license, so a fairly free license, so that was exciting. Um, and that has enabled that to go out into the wider community and for people to be able to share it. But it also, and this was a key um, bonus for my colleague, was that this brought their work to a whole new community because sharing in the open community helped her to reach even more academic colleagues um, who are interested in teaching and learning in this area. So the key kind of selling points for me with this particular colleague was the ease of licensing. Um, just being able to add the Creative Commons logo and text made it very clear to everybody that it was intended for reuse and they were encouraged to adapt it. And then secondly, that engagement with a new community. And one top tool that was helpful in having that conversation with that colleague was this um, example, you'll have seen Alistair shared it as well, of um, different types of Creative Commons license and just understanding that spectrum. So my second case study, and this is probably going to sound quite familiar to many of you, was around the pandemic. We were all, as you'll remember, scrabbling for 
developing courses and resources for online use, but none of us were on campus. We were suddenly at home with, you know, a mobile device or maybe a laptop or desktop, but no real access to professional facilities that we might normally have and really needing to be able to get access to relevant images, audio and video quite quickly to support our students online. So being able to talk to colleagues and say, do you know what, you don't have to create all of this yourself. There's already a really wealth of information um, and resources out there. So introducing them to the different open repositories and introducing them to open licensing to make sure that they were used appropriately really helped address that need. Um, so that was embedded not just in mandatory staff training that happened at Heriot Watt throughout the pandemic, but also in our PG CAP um, and in our regular sharing practice sessions. So starting out with people, you know, engaging small scale, just images, video, and then getting much larger, larger scale to whole courses and adapting that kind of thing. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those in a second. Um, but that discussion really helped um, expand awareness of OER and particularly um, being able to say to people, how do you search for them? So addressing that not knowing where to find. So being able to say if you're searching on Google, you know, or YouTube, make sure that you filter for an open license or use the Creative Commons search. Um, and that really helped people have confidence that what they were using was licensed for the way they wanted to use it. So key selling points here, being able to access uh, resources you could easily adapt and knowing where to find. Um, and just a couple of examples, and I have to say the open science um, OER in particular have been particularly popular with colleagues. And um, you'll notice that uh, University of Edinburgh features quite heavily there. Um, third case study, and this is my final case study, has been again around the pandemic. And that was providing support for staff to really rapidly upskill on supporting students with online learning. Now, the LTA and Harriet Watt were quite quick off the mark with this. And that meant that other learning and teaching centres were able to use the resources we'd developed. And particularly for those that are maybe less well resourced, found that really useful to have access to those resources. But then it was that sharing back. So we were using resources from, say, the National Teaching and Learning Forum in Ireland, and they were using ours. And within the OER community, there was an extensive sharing of those resources. And then that share back. So we were all developing on each other's. So the questions that we've been talking about with both those who write for us, at Harriet Watt, um, that we license everything as we are now, why might you want to use them and why might you want to share in that way? So many of these points you've heard already from Alistair and from Stuart and from Steph, um, but I will reiterate just the really nice thing is being able to adapt to suit your students. So being able to make it more accessible, more diverse, more tailored to um, your course and your context. And that's been a real selling point for colleagues. So yes, I've got the core information that I want from the OER and I'm going to adapt it to add this special bit that fits my particular course. That's been a real popular point. Um, the other nice thing is actually just being able to access high quality resources. So instead of being behind a paywall, it's been something that you can get free and open. And that, of course, when we're talking about students who, you know, maybe um, don't have a lot of money to spare, that's very helpful. So finally, why would you want to do this? If you're thinking about whether you'd want to release your own resources as OER, my answer to you is absolutely yes. The more we share, the more OER we have. Now, if you're nervous about sharing, then please be reassured the OER community are lovely and supportive. I mean, who wouldn't want to get supportive feedback on their work? And when you see others reuse and develop what you've started, that's a real boost. And that really does help with that imposter syndrome. It also helps with promotion prospects. Um, OER really is that gift that keeps giving as we give out and then we share back and that creates that virtuous cycle. Now, you might want to start quite small, try using an OER, adapt it a little bit, share it back, see how that goes. Or if you're feeling confident, 
pick something that you're happy to share and put it out there with a Creative Commons license on it. And top tip, picking up on something in the chat, always make sure that when you're sharing and when you're adapting, you're using the relevant license. So looking back at the original resource in the first place. Now, if you're still not sure about engaging with all this, then how about just engaging with the open education community in the first place, coming to some of the conferences I've linked on the slide, following some of the hashtags. I think you'll find that being part of such a supportive community really does boost your confidence and increase your understanding, but it also increases your networks, your adds new ideas and your practices across the globe. Now to finish, if you're still not sure, I'd like to offer one practical gift. If you want to venture into this and you're not sure about things, then drop me a line and I'll be really happy to work with you on it. Collaboration and sharing is at the heart of open education. We say sharing is caring. And wouldn't we all like a little bit more care in our lives? Thank you very much, Rosemary. And uh, that's a great offer as well. Um, Rosemary hasn't shown it on her slide yet, but on if you move to the next slide, Rosemary, people can then see um, see your contact details there. And again, um, for anybody wanting to look at any of the content from the session today, the link here um, takes you to the page we're currently on. And um, although that hasn't got Lou and uh, Steph's resources on it, um, that their resources will be on the recording, which you'll hear about next week once we've had a time. Uh, once Ron's had time to process and upload it, or Lillian, or whichever one of you is doing that. So over to Ron now. Uh, thanks, Alistair. Well, it's it's all of us, isn't it? So um, we'd encourage the guest speakers to all turn on your videos and mics again. Um, <coughs> there were lots of questions um, and additional links and things in the text chat. So this is a Fortunately, we're running to time, so this is a, an opportunity for more interaction and further questions um, to the guest speakers um, and the ability to uh, answer those questions verbally rather than just via the text chat. So, um, Alistair Lillian, was there anything particular you picked up on? I notice one of you has added some notes in our um, session plan. So I was yeah. very interested in um, <clears throat> some of the discussion that in fact you took part in as well Ron in the text about if it's non-commercial how do you know whether or not you can use it and, and where that you know, where that decision is made I wondered if Stuart had any kind of guidance from what you do at Edinburgh yeah well I think you know using the main area that we have problems with this and, and debates is is around um, the OERs that we use on on our MOOCs. We've got a lot of, of MOOCs, and when we're creating media for those courses, can we then use non-commercial licensed um, media into those um, into those courses because we're there in partnership with external companies, and those MOOC companies are are quite clearly kind of yeah. commercial entities. Yeah. Um, for within the university, it, it, it's, it, we find that less of an issue that we don't consider the university to be a commercial entity. Okay. And is that the same for you, Rosemary and Harriet? What do, that your understanding will be that the university wouldn't count as a commercial entity. So somebody just using um, a, a non-commercial um, badged Creative Commons would be fine. Yeah, likewise, universities set up for charitable purposes rather than commercial. So yeah, non-com is absolutely fine. Okay, that's that's really helpful. I think the, the link that Beth shared about um, from the British Museum is really useful. I think they've got some examples of what they consider to be commercial and non-commercial. And I think the point that it's not based on the particular user, but more like their intentions for yeah. doing it. So in agreement with everyone else, like, I. I and also thinking about it, like, would it annoy me if somebody did this with something? <laughs> would I be annoyed if a teacher took our resources and used them in their courses, their normal university courses? No, absolutely not. Go yeah. on and do it. Yay. Would I be annoyed if they put that in a MOOC that they were charging loads of money for and mm. it was mostly myself? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would be. Um, 
but yeah the the examples i'll put the link in the chat again were really useful so thank you for sharing that i think it was beth apologizes apologies i yeah. think it was beth yeah yeah that was really useful thank you so I did have another um, question early on when Stuart was was talking, um, and and there was a little bit of discussion in the chat about where OER responsibility sits in your organisation and whether that then impacts people's approaches to it. So if uh, like at Uni of York, um, I guess we we kind of rely on our library related uh, staff to kind of push that agenda. So it gets a sense of like, oh, everything's got to be tied up with the whole copyright issue. And, you know, do we know what we're doing there? And then I noticed, Stuart, that you're saying that it sits within um, teaching and learning. And, and I wondered if you felt that was maybe... Uh, that that could make a difference in an organization in terms of wide adoption? Um, I think so. We were very clear that we wanted it to, to sit as a teaching practice, or we are to be thought of as a teaching practice. So it was with clear links to the library. We work very, very closely with our library colleagues on this. Um, they have an open by default policy and and we a lot of the sessions that we do, we, we run collaboratively with uh, um, library colleagues on on copyright because they've got much more expertise in that area um, in terms of the kind of responsibility like, we kind of see the responsibility as an individual one and that's why our focus is on developing um, digital skills and literacies around uh, openness um, so you know for example in terms of ensuring that kind of the the resources that are shared um, meet accessibility guidelines and things like that that's that's kind of detailed in our policy and it's something that um, is the responsibility of the the individual we also talk about head of school responsibility um, in case there, there's something that kind of breaks those policies uh, or, or guidelines that the university has um, so yeah in terms of in terms of the, the responsibility I, I'd say we, we kind of focus on the on, on the individual skills. It almost, uh, it's made me kind of think it would be an interesting poll to run across the sector for where OER responsibility lies, at which department, and, and versus how sophisticated or mature you feel adoption of OER, uh, creation of OER is within the university and see this relationship between the two. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I think Mike, Mike did ask a general question. Uh, how many universities provide guest access to their VLE so that material can be OERs? And that's a very interesting point because um, on, on, on some uh, VLEs, you, you can have guest access to courses. Um, most likely from universities, it's about giving people tasters rather than pure OER, um, you know, as, as a rationale. What do other people think? Yeah, can I just, uh, Lillian, I'll just come in on that. You know, I, I mean, I, our university had a policy to not to give guest access. I always gave guest access to all my courses, to anybody. Um, but the worry was, and as I've put in, that staff are, you know, are not checking the copyright of material they're, they're putting on slides. And since nobody um it else is checking them there was a worry about getting sued and the argument was you can get away with it if you present it to your students because you know it's not open on the internet so nobody else knows you're doing it yeah and e-learning generally has always been the magnifying glass on practice things like copyright grammar <laughs> use of bad animated GIFs, <laughs> you know, the moment you make something available or digital, people are always, there's an attached fear as well, isn't there, to, to kind of starting down that road. Um, I just wanted to bring in uh, Neil's um, question there about uh, whether anyone in this group has experience of um, using uh, OER repositories. I think Lucy <clears throat> has a, a reply to that one in the chat. Okay, and I know that that you know, along with OER, there, there's this pedagogy and the idea of creating something and making it available to people, and then behind that or under that is that foundation of metadata, 
Mm. (laughs) And, uh, you know, knowing all the taxonomies that you might need to kind of, and that's where that library support, that's where working, co-working with the library is so important as well, isn't it? Ah, now we have Paul Hodgson who has volunteered his uh, expertise as well as Rosemary. He's responsible for Moodle's OER repository, new and VLE independent. Wow. So, do you want to tell us a bit about it? Yeah, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm from York. Um, Obviously, I work for an Australian company, but that's why I'm here. I saw your seminar and thought, oh, I'll I'll just check in and see how you're doing. Um, In my background, it's higher ed, and I was an ed tech director in a university. And I've been working with Moodle for six months on Moodle.net, which is um, an open source free um, system for curating OER. Uh, Moodle.net is a central repository, but we're encouraging people to take it and use it as they want to use it. And essentially it plugs directly into Moodle, but also to any VLE um, to allow people to uh, build a profile as an educator, put OER resources directly on the site or link to them. A bit like OER Commons, um, but a lot more modern and a lot more social. And the key to it will be, we're going to federate it. So let's say that the University of York installed their own OER system, uh, Moodle.net. They could customize it in any way they wanted to, to make it look like their own, but they could federate it back to other universities' OERs and to central OER, so that when you search it, you get the whole world of OER at your fingertips, ready for use in the uh, in the VLE or independently. Um, so that's where we are. We've just released it. We, we took big status off it last week. So you can now download it and, and use it free, open source. Can you pop in the appropriate links, Paul? Sure. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, I think we're all starting to kind of, um, you know, apart from Moodle.net, um, I think uh, Rosemary suggested open.edu. They have a, an ecosystem for creating and sharing um, uh, resources, which is which is really interesting to know. Um, and then Celine mentioned MetaFinders, and I presume you mean like Mason or Oasis, but you know, if I went and searched the internet for Oasis, I'm going to come back with a band rather than uh, <laughs> the MetaFinder. So again, Not if you read the study skills guidance on doing a good Google search. <laughs> I shall go and do that, that <laughs> brush up on that straight away. <laughs> yeah, just see what uh, Steph and Lou have been doing. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Mason.deepwebaccess.com forward slash long URL. So I'm glad you've popped that in, Lucy. Um, and, and I'm not sure if we already have these links in our own resources, Alistair, from early no, on. Some of, these, some of these are definitely new. So if, yeah. if anybody that's got some resources um, and even some of the more slightly esoteric ones that are about the metadata that's still something that's important for people to know about could you please pop them into that padlet have you got the padlet link handy again yep. Lillian I, I'll pop the padlet link in the chat and the reason um, I'm asking if, if folk who are popping the links in there do that is because they can then put a, a little sentence next to it which will be better contextualizing than we would be able to mm-hmm. do We'll be adding the chat to the end of the recording as well, to the bottom of the recording, so none of your links will be lost from the chat. But if you add it to the pad, that you can contextualize it a little bit better, can't you? Um, and, and that's the thing. So um, you know, repositories. I mean, two thousand and three. I was, I was. You know, we were looking at lots and lots of work around repositories and metadata, um, and it felt like we needed. GISC or an organization to to kind of step into that space. And I feel like it started and failed multiple times. And I'm just wondering if open.edu is now like a really good, reliable space and Moodle.net is is trying to step into that space. You know, um, it is trying to find that one or two, well, a handful of, of key places, reliable spaces that won't be here today and gone tomorrow as we know that's that's the worry isn't it uh lillian i'm 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 conscious we'll keep the discussions going but we need to just quickly um round off the last few pages in our resource so a reminder to everybody that the main resource that we've been screen sharing which includes uh uh, two of the 
the presentations that you've seen and, and Alistair, Alistair mentioned the recording of um, the other one will be available um, probably early next week. Um, so we have a, a few remaining pages in this resource um, and we usually just cover off. So there's a page about the three of us who've been running the project since the first official three years of the project, but have kept it going because of the community that um, grew from those first three years. Uh, a reminder that our next webinar, we're not doing one in December, we've decided to let everyone have um, some time off over Christmas and we'll pick up again in January. And this one is about, the next one's about learning analytics. So just like our excellent guest speakers today, if anyone's got anything they would like to share about their use of learning analytics, we'd be keen to hear from you and have a quick chat to arrange for you to a guest slot. If you haven't joined our mailing list already, um, you should do because that's where we'll publicize the availability of the recording. And also, we like to think that people would um, reflect further on what they've seen and heard today and you know, share those thoughts and links and resources via the mailing list as well. Um, we'll ask you to share your what one thing um, as part of this as well, but just to pick up on um, the whole kind of OER that we've been using throughout the four or five years of this project now, we use Xerti and Xerti is free and open source. It's part of the free and op open source family that is part of the Aperio Foundation. Um, and it's a big driver and it's a big reason why we use Xerti and lots of our resources can be downloaded and repurposed and you'll find guides within this main resources to uh, how to do that and the benefits of that. And also, as we said earlier on, there's our mini journeys, including one on repurposing OER, if I remember correctly, that you can access and there's a step-by-step -step <clears throat> guide on how to do that. If you access this resource, you get, um, you, there's a results page at the end you could download and, and use for a CPD record or whatever. Um, so a reminder, if we go back to um, the discussion here, that we'd be keen to hear from you 26th of January at one o'clock. If you'd be keen to talk about your use of learning analytics, there's contact details, email, or a contact us form that you can use there. And what we usually end up with here is uh, um, your reflections about what one thing you will do. And we'll put a link direct to the text wall. And one of the reasons I've we- just done that. Do, oh, you've done that learning. Okay. One of the reasons we recommend using that or try to use that rather than just the, the Zoom text chat is that you can continue contributing to that after the, the session. And also the result the responses are available immediately after the session rather than the text chat being lost as soon as we've finished the, the session and the recording. So we'd be keen to get your thoughts on what action you will take as a result of what we've discussed today. Um, there's been plenty of suggestions about how you might get involved in a wider community of OER. Um, and obviously, you most people will say they'll review the resources and review the recordings and so on. But it's really good if you can be specific about an actual action that you might take. And for those people who don't have to rush off, we normally hang on for five or ten minutes after the session so we can continue the discussion. And uh, so do hang on if you'd like to. We'll keep the discussion going. I I need to pick up on the comment from um, Lucy about the use of um, Sugi to allow Xerti to be embedded in other VLEs being a game changer. Um, good to hear that, Lucy. I, I've been working with a number of universities, helping them um, configure their Xerti installs to take full advantage of LTI, but also ideally XAPI as well. And it's all part of our tools. You can visit the Xerti community site and the recordings of those webinars for more details about the, the really kind of powerful potential of all of that. And then a last request, if you haven't um, had a chance yet to put in any of your kind of um, nuggets, your golden nuggets of links uh, that it would be useful to share, do pop them into the Padlet as soon as you can. <laughs> 
some X API fans and the people who don't understand the X API magic will be going what? <laughs> That's all right. I'm going what? <laughs> I can say the letters. That's I'm less able to explain. <laughs> I can't. I just think it does some magic in the back that allows one thing to talk to another. As far as I'm concerned, that's what it does. It allows some pairing to happen. <laughs> this session has gone by really, really fast. <laughs> Thank you very much to all our contributors as well for sticking to time. That that's helpful. I mean, I'm going to stop the recording here. Yep. It's almost a third.